Hi, welcome to the State of the Nation. Mike Sham, your host. As you know by now, I'm sure you've subscribed to the channel, which is growing like crazy. And with me today is the numbers guy, Wayne Sussman, and probably the leading uh, numbers watcher in terms of, uh, of voting trends. And uh, we've had a whole lot of by-elections. Welcome to the State of the Nation again, Wayne. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the last time we spoke, we were in a different studio. Yes. You've upgraded. Yeah. This is it's really great to be here. But uh, apologies to those who are viewing. I'm not looking my best self because Johannesburg is going through a major water crisis right now. So I had to have an early morning swim after my run at about 6.30 in the morning. It wasn't very pleasant. Yeah, no, Wayne and I had a discussion about, uh, about bedtimes and waking up times. Wayne's an early bird. And uh, yeah, well, neither of us could get to, to the to the mirror to shave this morning. So let's let's jump straight into it. The last time we were together, it was just after the local government elections in 2021. We analysed the way it looked at that stage. Uh, it was just at that period that there was a few surprise moves in the coalitions, and uh, the DA had been installed in uh, in these uh, Gauteng metros and uh, and. Since then, there's been a hell of a lot of movement, um, which we can discuss. But most importantly, there's been some by-election action, which you and I seem to be the two people that really feel that by-elections are a hell of a good guide of where South Africa is. And I've been listening to you and watching and reading your writings. And you are you read uh, some of those by-election results differently to the way other people read them, especially with regards to the performance of the ANC. Great. So let's focus on those by-election trends and the way you read it. If we have an isolated by-election in a particular area, we note it. It might be a trend. I'm thinking now that the first, we've only had one by-election in the free state since the 2021 local government elections. There, the EFF shocked the ANC. But I don't want to read too much into that because I need to see more by-elections in the Free State. So in parts of the country like KwaZulu-Natal, the Eastern Cape, in Pumalanga, we've seen a lot of by-election activity. And therefore, we see trends emerge. And a lot of those trends are holding firm from what we saw in the 2021 local government elections. And just to remind uh, those people watching State of the Nation, um, the ANC had its worst ever performance in a major election. We saw the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, go backwards. They dropped support uh, to fall into the low 20s. And the EFF, the third largest party in South Africa uh, in the last few local government elections, the last few national elections, remember they grew in the last national election. In this particular local government elections, they grew somewhat. They grew because of KwaZulu-Natal and parts of the Eastern Cape. If one looked at those numbers carefully, it's very concerning with what the EFF was doing in parts of the country it originally did well in. I'm speaking about Polokwane, where Julius Malema comes from, Sashekho Township. I'm speaking about Rustenburg and Marakana, which is actually in Maribeng, but let's call about, which is Brits, those two particular municipalities. That is absolutely key to the EFF. And you look at the results closely there, they're either replicating what they did the last time or dropping support. The same in the Gauteng metros. So what did this tell us after the 2021 local government elections? That there wasn't consolidation, there was fragmentation. And we've seen that fragmentation continue in by-elections. So yes, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, we're seeing the ANC having a tough and torrid time. However, what makes me feel that the ANC are going to, I'm not saying they're not going to lose ground. Remember, they got 57.5%. I think they'll lose 7, 8, 6.5 percentage points. They'll hover around that 50% mark. Why are they going to hover around the 50% mark? Because of provinces like Limpopo, which, by the way, is uh, has the fifth large, most amount of voters in the country. Provinces like the Eastern Cape, which has the fourth most amount of for third most amount of registered voters, fourth most amount of actual voters. The Western Cape has more actual voters. Those are not small provinces. And there you see the ANC support holding firm. And we can go into those numbers. Can I just uh, just jump in there? Because you referenced the 57%. That was the last general election, yes. 2019. Now, 
in 2021, in the local government elections, they went down to 46% if one goes overall. Yes, correct. Right? Now, in South Africa, there has historically been no real blurring of the lines, not enough blurring of the lines between local government elections and general elections, and the one has generally been a proxy for the other. Are you saying, you're either saying one of two things. You're either saying that that trend is broken, so in other words, people are voting differently in local government elections, is what they do in the general elections, or you're saying that something has happened that's improved the ANC's performance since 2021. So usually in a national election, turnout is higher. A higher turnout, particularly in rural areas, will of course favor the ANC. Just to remind you, one of the reasons why the ANC falls into 46.7% uh, in the 2021 local government elections is there are a lot of local parties who are running, small regional parties, which might not run in the national election. That's a point. We know traditionally, globally, not just in South Africa, people use the local government elections as a midterm election, as a check on power, a reminder to the dominant party, guys, if you don't put up your socks, we're going to vote you out. So I think that voters in the main urban centers, which again, those provinces, because remember it's a national election and a provincial election, Gauteng, the Western Cape, KwaZulu Natal, will continue to punish the ANC in this election, that the ANC is going to have a tough time and they're going to lose ground in all those three provinces. However, what I'm also saying, the counterbalance to that is, even though the ANC is going to lose support, they will have less far less members of parliament. There are going to be a lot of unhappy people who are going to be without a job than they currently have. But I'm saying this number of 42% I don't see right now. I'm not saying it can't happen. We're a long time between now and the election day. Uh, the election campaigns haven't started. But I'm saying, yes, the ANC is in trouble, but they're not in such bad trouble that they might need to go knock on Julius Malema's door, Gate McKenzie's door. Okay, so uh, you seeing them somewhere around the 50% level, even though in the last local government election overall, they got 46%. So you see an improvement. Yes. Uh, because there's a few of the smaller parties, uh, independents, etc., and those votes might go to the ANC. I don't know if they've done enough to, uh, to improve on that performance because it seems to me that their performance in the metros has been decidedly uh, less favourable, especially their disruption of the coalitions in, in, in you know, populous places like, uh, like the Gauteng metros. And, and what seems to be a hard-hitting problem that they're having in KZN. Huge problem. So the Western Cape, let's, as I want to put those three together, they end up having a very tough time there. I don't see them making serious inro inroads. So let's just remove it. You've, you didn't ask about it, but I want to include it there because it's a lot of people in the Western Cape. With regards to Gauteng, this is the one unknown in this election. It's an urban uh, transient population. Highly, um, there's a lot of growth in Gauteng. People continuing to come to Gauteng. So it's really hard to predict, unlike a rural area, which is more defined geographically. So I definitely think the ANC is below 40% in Gauteng for 2024. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons why they're going to lose a lot of support. By the way, let me just point out that the ANC acknowledges that. If you look at the NEC chosen after the, mm -hmm. after the uh, last national conference, there are a lot of younger people. So they're acknowledging that I think it's an, an effort to say we need you to do better amongst young people. And a lot of people from Gauteng, they're acknowledging that they have a challenge in Gauteng. So Gauteng, I agree, is all over the place, and I've held, I, I take that into account when I make my current projection. Places like Mzumkulu, that southern part of KwaZulu Natal, was Jacob Zuma's heartland. Now we're seeing the ANC lose a lot of ground in by-elections there. We expect the ANC to lose ground in northern KwaZulu Natal, the IFP's traditional stronghold, but you're seeing the ANC come unstuck in Peter Maritzburg, in Durban, the high population centers. A caveat for the ANC is that they recently won a by-election off the IFP. It was a very marginal ward, wasn't a major swing, but the ANC still overperformed. They didn't just win the ward by a narrow margin, they won it by quite some distance. And we need to unpack this. Are we seeing a broader, so you're speaking about the ANC, but I want, remember in the beginning I spoke about the DA going backwards and the ANC going backwards. 
Where the IFP lost this ward is an escort uh, in KwaZulu Natal on the end, or just off the N3 when we drive to Durban, or people from Durban drive to Johannesburg. Maybe because the IFP are in government there, and people are saying, look, the IFP are not doing a good job in escort, we're not going to vote for them, we're going back to the ANC. So that might be the ANC's saving grace. However, I think people associate the ANC more with provincial government. So I think the IFP have a lot of momentum. Are they able to raise money? Are they able to run a slick campaign, which, yes, appeals to their traditional older, more rural voters, but also captures the hearts and minds of the areas of Kuzuna Natal, where they haven't traditionally done well, and I'm speaking about Durban and Peter Maritzburg, uh, that remains to be seen. So those two areas, if the ANC are in trouble there, that's why I have them hovering at the 50% mark, but I can go back to you and speak about the Eastern Cape and Limpopo, which is a good news story for the ANC from an election perspective. Okay, before we move uh, to, to those areas, let's just look at, uh, at KZN. Now, do, do you understand that uh, you know, your, your speciality is looking at the numbers, not political analysis as such? And I'm just trying to work out, there's, there's, there's two trends in KZN that seem to uh, emerge to me as an observer. One is the obvious growth that the IFP have enjoyed. Uh, there's been a total collapse of, of EFF support, right? Complete collapse. Uh, and, you know, I, I interviewed uh, uh, Velon Cossini in Tlabisa here recently, the leader of the IFP, and, and I'm not convinced yet. And he seems to be a hell of a good guy, but he's got a bit of a leadership problem, hasn't he? You've got the cold, old fingers of uh, Mangasutu Butelezi around the throat of, uh, of the IFP. And we know that he's a guy who is never going to go away gracefully. I don't think gracefully exists in his, uh, in his uh, lexicon. And he's definitely putting, you know, to, to an observer, I'm, I'm worried about how much the Butelezi factor disrupts the IFP. And then second to that, and most importantly, is, is the support for the IFP um, less about the IFP and more about a, a, a revenge vote against the ANC? Great. So let me, let's speak about Mr. Khlabisa, the leader of the IFP. I think that is someone who can definitely build a profile around. This is someone, he was the mayor of the municipality, Khlabisa, so it's not mm. many people get to be the mayor <laughs> Uh, of, a of, the, of a municipality with the same name as their surname. Uh, he was a school principal. He's got a life story here. I think he speaks uh, very, very well. Um, and he brings a new, I mean, he's not a young man, but he brings a new youthful energy to the IFP. It's going mm. to be, I don't profess to be an expert on rural northern presidential politics, on tradition, all of that. But I think for the IFP to really reach its potential, uh, yes, they need the people who who yearn for Butelezi and still see Butelezi in the same light people in the ANC, m older voters might have seen Mandela and Becky. But it's absolutely key for the IFP to let Khlabisa to lead in his own way. The party has achieved incredible success. Yeah. The IFP hasn't had the success since the first election, yeah. this type of growth. And a lot of it has to be credited to him and I agree that he's not been given the free reign because of this whole issue of the T-shirts of Butelezi's face. He can't feel, he can't be allowed to feel that he always has to be obsequious yeah. to, um, to Mr. Butelezi. Yeah, and of course, there is the, there is the issue to any political watcher to, to, uh, to make that the IFP has never, ever been good in government. They were the originators of corruption when they, when they were in charge of KZN after 94. And some of the things they did were, were ridiculous, right, in terms of bad governance. And, and there's been no evidence yet uh, that they can govern well. So, you know, the, the, let's hope because, he, you know, as you say, he seems to be a solid pair of hands. Uh, he comes across well. He says the right things. But, uh, you know, if the IFP... Uh, there's every chance that they could do really well, and there's every chance that they could uh, just be a very fleeting moment and a bit of a re revenge vote against, uh, against the ANC. Let's hope. Um, so I think uh, the IFP are going to do well in this election. I'm confident about that. Um, I think they're going to be doing uh, much better than some of the other parties people are speaking about. I think there's going to be real growth. Um, so just to point that out, 
a lot of the municipalities, you can see their negative reports of municipalities where they may have. Now, these are really poor municipalities, so that's, it's, it's a hard hand you've been dealt with, but you have to play that hand. However, the IFP are governing in places like Newcastle and places like Richards Bay. Yes, KwaZulu-Natal has real problems. Yes, South Africa has real challenges. However, these are major municipalities which have an impact on our economy. So if between now and the 2024 elections they can show a difference between where, uh, where historically the ANC governed in Newcastle and Richards Bay in those respective municipalities, and they can show that difference, they can show they can attract investment, they can show that they can create jobs, do basic services, I think they can turn that narr narrative around. Um, Wang, before we leave KZN, uh, just you know, briefly... There's obviously been this wonderful story of uh, Chris Pappas. You know, he's he's been uh, probably the DA's rock star. Him and Jordan Hill Lewis down in Cape Town, on a very local government, on a you know, in, in on a real sort of local level, as the mayor uh, up in the Midlands. Uh, as and there's been quite good gains for the DA in some of the more urban areas in Etiquini. It seems to be the one area where the DA is actually on you know on a growth path. Is, can anything be read into that? Do you think this is a, a start of a better performance for the DA within KZN? Of the nine provinces in South Africa, the one I'd be most bullish about for the DA is KwaZulu-Natal. And look, Etiquini Durban's a major city. It's the third la largest city in South Africa, voter-wise. There's a, a platform for them to grow. I think uh, with a lot of the Indian traditional Indian parties battling, they can grow in those communities as well. Chris Pappas is part of it. Um, Dean McPherson, I think, does has um, run a very disciplined ship. Their, their recent deal with the IFP is very interesting, focusing on service delivery. And the by-election results speak to this, that we haven't just, we've seen it in Indian areas, in a colored area, and in traditional white areas. The DA continuing to grow, and that's a good sign for them. And John C. and Hazen will want to study that. Why are they doing particularly well in KwaZulu-Natal? Can they replicate that in other parts of the country? Right, now let's go to those other areas where the ANC are doing quite well. Great, so I think we've got to, often we just focus on metro areas, and I'll give you an incredible statistic. When one thinks of South Africa, remember there are eight metros, um, and Mangawu and Bloemfontein, a major, um, major city for some, maybe a drive-through for others, but it is a significant city, the judicial capital of South Africa. In the 2021 local government elections, the ANC got 30,000 more votes in Mangawung, this metro, a place which we, if we listen to the weather reports, always there, compared to a place where the ANC did best in the country in a municipality called Tulamela, which is Toyandu, home of Black Leopard soccer team. Bloemfontein is much bigger than Toyandu, but they only got 30,000 more votes because the ANC got 80 percent of the vote in Toyandu. It's not a rural outpost. This is a major population center. And I think we need to understand this. This is one of the reasons why I remain quite confident that the ANC are not at 42 percent, but, <clears throat> but currently at 49, 50 percent. And you look at a place like Louis Trichart, Mercado, I think the ANC got 80 percent of the vote there. Again, this is an agriculture center. This is on the road to Zimbabwe, a major transit route. This is an important part of the Limpopo economy. There are seven municipalities in the Eastern Cape where the ANC got over 75% of the vote. These, these are astonishing figures. And you might say that these areas are governed terribly, but I say you have to give credit to the ANC as a political party. They continue to capture the hearts and minds in places like the Chris Harney district, um, those parts of KwaZulu-Natal close, to, sorry, of the Eastern Cape close to KwaZulu-Natal, more of the inland parts of the Eastern Cape, some of the coastal Pondo land areas on the coast. Those particular parts of the Eastern Cape, the ANC is absolutely rock solid. We see COPE almost fall apart yesterday. We see the UDM continuing to flatline. We see the DA, who've been the official opposition in the Eastern Cape for a number of years now. They've never been able to penetrate these areas. And these aren't, again, Five, six thousand voters in the municipality. There, lot, there, there are a sizable sum of voters in the, those areas. And the ANC can continue to heart, capture the hearts and minds there, continue to capture. Let's go to Mpumalanga quickly. There's a municipality called Inkumazi, and here's your fun numbers fact for the day. Inkumazi has, um, has 20 wards, okay? 20 wards. So 
you've got the possibility of having um, 20 councillors up for by-election. It's a small municipality. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me... I didn't mean, I just want to refilm this. Okay. okay. We're now going to go to Mpumalanga. I just want to speak briefly about this because this is where the sixth most amount of voters are in South Africa. We go to near the Eswatini border, this old Swaziland border, and there is formerly Petrotif Makondo, Emakondo. This municipality has been plagued by terrible instability. This is a small, modest sized municipality. And here's your fun fact, numbers fact for the day. There are 20 wards in this municipality. It's modest size by Petrotif, coal mining areas, some timber plantation areas. 20 wards. Okay, we look at all the metros in Gauteng, the three metros, Ekurene, Johannesburg, Chwani, they're 350 wards. We've had seven by-elections since 2021 in the 350 wards across Gauteng. In Little Mkondo, remember I said 20 wards, we've had 10 by-elections. I mean, it's an unbelievable st stat. The ANC has won 10 out of 10 there. And again, you've seen, sadly, political violence, some ANC councils being murdered. You've seen crazy ANC infighting. You've seen councils resigning or dying of natural causes. The EFFs tried hard. Independents have tried hard. But the ANC is 10 for 10. Despite the challenges in those municipalities, the populations there trust the ANC over the other parties. And I think we need to give the ANC credit sometimes for that ability to continue to capture the hearts and minds there. Now, um, to, to look at the Eastern Cape, we recently uh, had Ethel Trollope here. He's um, obviously a veteran of, of Eastern Cape politics, especially in Quebecer. They are building structures in some of these places. They seem to be the party most likely to build structures that could challenge the, you know, the, the hegemony of the ANC in these rural areas because I think they're the only party that's actually speaking the language of these places. Do you think they'll make inroads into some of these places where the ANC are so rock solid, if one thinks of the Eastern Cape and, uh, and Pumalanga, Limpopo? Yeah, so the EFF, sorry, Action SA, I must never say EFF and Ethel <laughs> Trollope in the same sense. Action SA have contested two by-elections in the Eastern Cape. One was in the Kariche area near Utenhaeg um, in the Nelson Mandela Bay metro, and they got about 10% of the vote. It was a solid performance. Didn't shoot the lights out, but didn't do terribly badly. They would have been happy with that performance. There was another by-election where they contested in the town of Tarkastat near Komani, formerly Queenstown. And, the, and Action SA did very poorly there. The DA did much better than them. Now, was it because of the candidates? I mean, Action SA actually had a quite a high-profile candidate. But so that's the by-election trends. The one result was fine. They'd been happier that the other result was really not good. When one looks at their, um, they are building structures everywhere. Ethel Trollope um, committed his life to politics and opposition politics. I mean, he ultimately wants to be in government. Uh, he's someone who's deeply committed to Action SA. You saw he came to your breakfast the other day in Johannesburg. This is his cause, and he knows he has to make a success of it. So I think they can uh, make some inroads into the Eastern Cape. It's a very tough market to crack because of those statistics I've just given yeah. you. So many municipalities with ANC got over 75% in the last elections. Um, and look, the one thing, Mike, and this is the thing about difference between by-elections and elections. So even though I love by-elections, I can tell you the limitations of by-elections. It's one thing putting all your eggs into one basket for a by-election and going hell for leather for it. It's another thing running an election. If you are competing in all nine provinces properly on election day, you need polling state agents in over, I think the number's 20,000. I forget the actual number of polling stations. It's like running McDonald's on steroids on for one day in South Africa. It's a hard, hard job. So that's the thing. Are those branches, action essays forming, are they going to be able to... Run, um, organize an election day well, make sure people are um, coming out to vote, making sure the elections are free and fair. That's going to be key for Action SA and other new entrants. Okay, so let's talk about the new entrants because uh, there's been a, a fair bit of noise, especially uh, in the urban centers. You know, some new parties uh, started by, in, in some cases, celebrity names. Um, 
and we haven't yet seen them go out for a run. Uh, I'm thinking you have Rizem Zanzi, Songhezo Zibi, uh, Build One South Africa, Musi Maimani, you know, Bongani Beloy even with Chaluba. Do you see those uh, parties, is it just untellable at this point whether they're going to start uh, making an impact into any areas whatsoever? Or do it's we a, have to wait a, until polling day? It's a great question. For those who are old enough and can think back to the 2016 local government election, and I'm last week about media coverage to answer your question, the, by now, the overwhelming majority of the coverage was on the ANC, the DA, and the EFF in that local government elections. In the 2019 national elections, we saw parties like Action SA get a lot of coverage, the Freedom Front, people started to notice the PA and the IFP, seven. Even more parties are going to be vying for that election coverage. And there's only so much journalists and media can cover. And that's why I think this lane of uh, this opposition lane, which is the DA used to have, let's say, center, uh, pro-business, pro-economy, uh, market economy parties, the DA had free reign of that. The Freedom Front and the PA have entered that, entered that lane in 2021 and Action SA. Now you're seeing those parties rise in Zanzi, uh, Build One South Africa and Bongani Beloy's party. I think it's going to be very hard for all of those parties. I do think we're going to see some, um, to use American term, winnowing of the field. Like someone like Bongani Beloy, who I think is a tremendously talented um, politician, young mayor, very, very important for the DA, one of their first public black mayors in Midvale in Johannesburg. But Midvale is not a metro. I think, to be honest, he is going to battle um, he, he's, uh, he, he's going to battle to really make uh, get a lot of media coverage and capture the hearts and minds. Because yeah. once the media start focusing on you, you have that ability. That was key with Action SA. The media took them seriously and people responded. Action SA were put on the spotlight and they captured the hearts and minds of people in Soweto and Four Ways. So that's going to be the challenge for uh, Rise Mzanzi. That's going to be the challenge for Musi Momani. How do you now take on an established vehicle like Action SA in that lane? Yeah. So, um, you know, they're gonna, there's, the struggle is going to be real. The one thing that I do notice uh, for some of those new parties, it seems like it, they understandably are not getting the kind of media they would li love. Uh, and certainly the SABC ain't going to cover parties that, that aren't really the ANC or the EFF. That seems to be quite captured. So, but certainly if one follows their social media, they're doing a lot of work, including Action SA, on the ground, recruiting and uh, registering voters and things like that. Uh, you know, these aren't theoretical parties. These are guys that are going out there and they're doing, they're literally doing that work that's thankless. All right? so you, you know it very, very well. You know, putting up a, a tent and registering voters and, uh, and getting people onto buses and getting them into far-flung places. Uh, that seems to uh, be happening. Do you think it's happening at scale or do you think it's just for social media eyes? I do think it's happening. I do think branches are being formed, but it's one thing forming a branch. It's another thing making sure those activists continue to do the hard work once the leaders... Because Herman Rashaba, Athol Trollope can't be there every day. So that's going to be absolutely key. And that's why, again, you have to be, give credit to the ANC, credit to the DA, credit to the EFF. They've done these rodeos before. They've built the structures. They know how to fight elections. And that's going to be hard. Credit to though has to be given to these new parties who've raised money and are continuing to raise money. However, once the opinion polls start coming out and they are not aligned to these parties' internal polls where they're telling the donors that they're going to do X percent in the Eastern Cape or the Free State, that'll be very interesting whether that continues and whether people will rather consolidate behind a larger party. That's an interesting development to watch. Now, Wayne, you, you referenced uh, our recent State of the Nation breakfast. And uh, for those that haven't watched the videos, I urge you to go and watch it. It, it was quite interesting where we gathered uh, many of the leaders of the party that have announced that they're going to be in, at, a, at a conference to hammer out coalition agreement that uh, precedes the, the, the next general election so that us as voters will know exactly what we're in for if we vote for one of these parties in terms of coalitions afterwards because I firmly believe, I uh, disagree, uh, 
to a degree with, with what Wayne's saying. I think that coalitions are a, are a fact. I think that, in my opinion, and, and judging by what I'm seeing, I think that the ANC will definitely be below, be below 50%, right? And, and, and I don't think it's going to be significant enough, but it'll be below 50%, which means, by definition, they might have a tame coalition, but they'll have a coalition, right? So in their best... In, 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 and we can split hairs, but it does matter when, you, when you're talking about 50%. But if you get to 48%, you need that other 2% from somewhere. Yes, you're going to get it by those proxy parties, you know, good and ATM, and those parties seem to be proxy ANC parties, so they do the election and then they throw the lot in immediately with ANC. But either way, we're headed for, for coalitions. Um, now, these talks that are happening between the DA, primarily the DA, the IFP, um, Action SA, and uh, um, Freedom Front Plus, and I've, I highlight them because they are parties with some track record already, with some positions, some votes. Uh, do you think it's going to enhance what they're trying to do, or do you think it's going to hurt them? Great. So a lot of people are just dismissing it outright. I think you've got to take it seriously. It's um, They understand what they're trying to do is make the impossible happen, and that's remove the ANC from power. That's why they call it the Moonshot Pact. Um, but voters need to understand what it's the same as, and I don't want to go off on a, on a tangent, but the same as independence running. I mean, it's so hard for me to understand the legislation. Imagine someone just yeah. a casual around the bri trying to understand it. So how is the moonshot pack going to enhance opposition politics? I, as a political watcher, still don't understand it. So the one value I could see is that parties, yes, they'll retain their own identities. And we saw the DA and the IFP do this service delivery agreement two days ago in Durban. But how is it actually going to enhance um, the, the yeah. project of removing the ANC for these opposition parties? That's going to be key. And maybe the convention will spell it out. It's hard for me to understand right now. One, on a practical level, I can think that the DA probably do not have good um, a, a lot of activists in northern KwaZulu Natal to make sure that the elections are free and fair and, the, and that the polling agents there are behaving. And I'm sure, likewise, the Freedom Front Plus doesn't have ma uh, many activists who truly believe in Houghton. However, if the parties are able to consolidate resources and say, look, we need to work together, this is the way we are going to work on election day, make sure that the ballots are counted fairly, make sure that the polling agents behave, that's a small upside. But I don't know how, at this stage, you take those four, because it is four parties, the other two are quite small, you take those four parties and that it's going to catapult you by 5 6%, an additional 5 I don't see that yet, but maybe we'll know more next month. Yeah, look, I mean, the, my reading of the situation is that they're trying to um, avert a situation that we've seen in some of the metros where, you know, according to our law, at the moment you've got 14 days after the election to put together a coalition. So if we say we're going to wait until afterwards and then now it's going to be, okay, uh, I'm the big guy, you're the small guy, this is the terms, etc. It's a very hurried process that can lead to bad outcomes, and it has. So I presume uh, the appeal would be, especially to long-suffering voters, saying, you know, look how badly these coalitions were handled. I don't want to vote for them again because they can't handle a coalition. And not really understanding what goes into those coalitions. So I presume that what they want to do is, is, is present that united front that we all know what, what, what is going to happen in the aftermath of the election. And that should, I'd imagine, enhance the appeal of uh, that pact. Correct. But it's, again, coalitions generally. Uh, I think of the Liberal Democrats in the United Kingdom when they were caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, when uh, the Labour Party fell below 50% of the seats, they had to make a decision. The national mood was against the Labour Party. They went to the Conservatives and they were punished heavily. Mm -hmm. So there's always a price to pay for some of the junior coalition partners. I also think that parties like Action SA will say, look, we support this. People know that we'd much rather work with the DA, even though... We like throwing bricks at each other, then work with the ANC or the EFF. However, are we cheapening our brand? Are we just showing ourselves the DA light if we sign up to the Moonshot Pact now? I think that's going to be a challenge. 
do I see a, f- a figure who's not leading one of those four, six parties right now emerging saying, look, guys, consolidate behind me. I don't see that person right now. So I think we have to wait and see. But uh, exactly what you say, those, those 14 days, it's not very conducive. It's not very fair. But again, imagine this, okay? So we know that it's going to be the ANC uh, versus the Moonshot Pact. Um, the end of the day, after the election, if b- both the Pact and the ANC are under 50%, who the media are going to be, who's going to get all the media attention? The parties who haven't committed to either, and they're going to get all the media attention. They're going to be able to extract more. So it's hard for parties to truly get on board in this. I understand that. If you, if Because if I say, look, I'm moonshot packed and people say, oh, the moonshot packs a DA thing. Then some voters might say, oh, I might as well just vote for the DA then. So I understand the angst that someone like Herman Mashaba might have. Someone like Musi Maimani, who's not part of the moonshot pact yet, might have. But uh, let's wait and see. I think they're trying to change our politics, trying to uh, prevent a, uh, present a big alternative. Let's see whether it uh, gathers momentum. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was uh, listening to those uh, guys speaking at, at our breakfast and uh, I realized that uh, sort of a, a strange comparison came to my mind and it's, it's the old story of almost a rugby trials match, right? I'm playing in a trials match, there's, there's one team against another team and they're going to pick the best team out of those two teams. You're kind of mentally playing. It's quite difficult because on the one hand, you want to play well so that you can be selected. But on the other hand, you don't want to make the other guy look too good who's playing with you, who's your teammate in this trials game. So, you, you know, do you give a, a, a ball so that the other guy can score a try and get the, get the headlines? Or do you try and go for the line yourself? So it's a, it is a very, very difficult uh, situation for everybody concerned. But well we're in a difficult time the question i want to ask you though wayne is let's just say they go and hammer out an agreement and suddenly this looks viable somehow not going to be that easy but let's just for uh, for illustration let's just say it does look viable uh where does does this leave the parties in the middle right do you see them getting squeezed out as the one block looks strong versus the other monolithic blo- block which already exists, i.e. the ANC EFF. That block seems to be clean. The guys in the middle that haven't committed, do you think that helps or harms them if the, if the coalition talks go well? So I think it's vital to understand this, the juxtaposition parties in a campaign face. Yes, Action SA and the DA dislike the ANC more than they dislike each other but their path to growth is sometimes easier at the expense of attacking each other because a, an action SA voter is more likely possibly to vote for the DA than the ANC and a DA voter is certainly more likely to vote for action SA than the ANC. And I think that is going to be another re- um, aspect which makes uh, the moonshot pack tougher, that in an election campaign it gets ugly, it gets nasty, and it's just easier to attack those who are most similar to you than someone who your supporters are less likely to vote for. Um, Wayne, I want to talk uh, lastly about uh, about the disruptors, because there's, there's two disruptors, one on, uh, one on one side and one on both sides, uh, and, uh, and that is, uh, let's talk about the Patriotic Alliance. Uh, I accuse the Patriotic Alliance of putting themselves in a position where they're betting after the race, right? They are, it's very clever to sit there, sit back and say, you see, I told you they would win when you said nothing, whoever they would be. And uh, we've seen them flip-flop from one side of the coalition to the other. Gaten McKenzie's loving this. He said he's there for power. So if he's there for power, wait until your vote swings you into power. And he goes one way or the other. But he seems to be having genuine support amongst colored voters, especially in poorer communities. First question, will this seriously threaten the DA's hold on the Western Cape? We're seeing three by-elections, which are good seats, Patricia DeLille's good seats next week in George. Um, I think it's going to be a fierce contest with the PA and the DA. And the DA, a lot of these councils defected to the DA, the two of them. Um, so they, the incumbents in a way, these former good councillors, but the PA are going hard for these seats. 
good, uh, sorry, George is the third largest municipality in the Western Cape. I don't think it's like the city of Cape Town, but if the PA does well, which I expect them to do, but even if they win those seats, they're going to have tremendous momentum and tremendous self-belief and go uh, hell for leather for the Western Cape next year. So I think that they can hurt the DA, them and the Freedom Front, who are going to work with the DA regardless. The PA are saying at your breakfast that they're happy to work with the DA, but are currently working with the ANC. Those are what keeps the DA up at night. The growth of the PA, uh, we are, and to some extent the Freedom Front. But Gates and McKenzie is a larger-than-life person, literally and figuratively. Um, he's, uh, he's a disruptor, as you say. He, he does politics in a new d and different way. And I do think the DA are concerned about them. Do they have enough colored representatives and leaders who can counteract this charm and his authenticity, even though he comes from Bloemfontein and lives in Johannesburg? So uh, just to put you on the spot there, do you see a genuine threat to the DA's uh, majority in the Western Cape? If the DA falls under 50%, the Freedom Front and or the ACDP will get them over the line. Okay, and then I want to just uh, ask you about the EFF because everybody is now sort of putting them, painting them, cementing them in the camp, working with the ANC. Do you see this as, as, a, as a given? that the EFF just happily works with the ANC? Do, or do you see it as a reverse takeover? That's how I see it. I think the EFF would like to work with the ANC to have the opportunity for patronage, to have the opportunity to be in power. But I'd, I think any smart observer would know that it's bad for their brand to be perceived as propping up the ANC. So again, let's assume the ANC gets below anything below 50%. I use the Liberal Democrat example in, um, in the UK. The parties which prop up the ANC are going to do it because there'll be cabinet positions and other opportunities. However, they're going to pay a price. So and that's the juxtaposition for the EFF. But from an ANC perspective, I do not think that they want to go into bed with the EFF and they do not want to go into bed with the PA because of that term you use, disruptor. There's an, un, un, an, an unpredictability. They are very hard to predict these political parties. You'd much rather work with a good, an al Jamaa, an African Independent Congress, not even the ATM, because they're also sometimes a bit volatile. One of those three parties who it's easier to manage, you, you know that they're not going to divorce you tomorrow morning. So I think you have to look from both from an EFF and an ANC perspective. They know that EFF will demand a hefty price and the ANC will look elsewhere before going to the EFF. Now, lastly, Wayne, with the stakes being so high in the next election, and I do believe they're very high because for the first time ever, we are talking legitimately at a, when people start saying that, uh, as we started this discussion, saying you're relatively bullish that the ANC might get more than 50%. Well, you know, even that discussion means that the, that the the, the sort of majority in the the government, the ruling of the country is is up for question. So it's an it's an important time. Do you think it's going to force people out of? Uh, and I know it's a sort of sounds similar to a question I've asked you earlier. But do you think people like Al Jamar, Good, etc., will retain any of the support that they've got? These proxy parties. Well, little parties. Al Jamaa got one seat. They were lucky. They were less than 0.25%. So they could be vulnerable. Um, they, I think their voters in Johannesburg will be disappointed in them. I don't know about their voters mm. in Cape Town. That remains to be seen. Parties like Good, one needs to see Delil's hunger. I mean, she's been very focused on her term as government minister. Um, they've lost their main organizer to the DA, Sean August. Um, he was expelled from the good before he was left, uh, rejoined the DA. So you have to look at all, all I, I think good are in trouble in the next election. The African Independent Congress, just to remind uh, the viewers, that's from Matatiel in the Eastern Cape. And it's an anomaly because they yeah. do worse in Matatiel every election, but grow in other parts of the country. Yeah. And I've, nev I've never worked it out. So it is a risk for the AN, uh, for for these parties and the ANC because, as I said, they they more stable coalition partners for the ANC. But I think all three of those parties are in trouble. 
Well, in Sussman, it's been interesting. Uh, you know, we, this has to be a regular part of what we discuss as we build up to, to 2024 and those general elections. These trends are going to come and go. I think the next time you and I need to sit together is after those coalition talks to see what comes out of that and whether it has an electoral impact. But uh, Wayne, thank you so much for joining us today. For everybody that's watched us to the end, thank you so much for joining us on the State of the Nation. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and we will see you the next time on the State of the Nation. Thank you.